your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Doug was right. We are going through this last part of 1 Thessalonians really fast. <laughs> we spent one week on rejoice evermore. Then we spent another week on praying without ceasing. And then we hit verse number 18, and that was a huge verse, but we still did it in one week. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And this week, we hit quench not the spirit. And really what, what we're finding as we're going through this is well, we have a church that's a new church. They're, they're babes in Christ. We have some good theology as we go through 1 Thessalonians. And just like a lot of new churches, when it's a new church, you know, they're working hard and they're growing in Christ and they're, and they're becoming like Christ and they're being transformed into the image of Christ. So it's a good church. It doesn't have a lot of issues, doesn't have a lot of problems. There are some. Some of the people there are concerned that they've missed out on the rapture, that um, some things have happened and they're going to miss out on some special blessings. And so Paul has to write and say, don't worry about it. Everything's good. And the people that have passed away already, they're not going to have a lower position in heaven. God's going to take care of them. Don't worry about it. But now we get over here, and Paul just writes some very practical things to a group of believers, and in particular new believers, to teach them how to grow. As we came to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 then, he started talking about a healthy flock. I'm going to kind of give you an outline as to how we got here. In the first part, we said that we saw how the sheep are to relate to the shepherds. And then we saw how the shepherds are to relate to the sheep. Then we saw how people are to relate to each other. Sheep to sheep. Now we are looking at how the sheep are to relate to the great shepherd, God. And so these commands are really uh, in regard to our spiritual relationship to the Lord. And if you remember last week we said, this is the will of who? It is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You want to know God's will for your life? He wants you to rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in everything. Now, there are simple commands. Not a lot to it, seemingly. But at the same time, it's very poignant and we recognize that through even simple little commands, we fail. Because we don't do this all the time, do we? There's times when my joy is sapped from me. There's times when I really have a hard time giving thanks. I don't want to give thanks at certain times. And there's certain individuals and human beings that are in my life that when they walk into my presence, all of that is sapped straight from me. They sap my joy. They sap my thanksgiving. And I don't want to be in a prayerful attitude when they're there. All the more so I should at those times. Now, there, there are certain people in our lives, aren't there, that, that when they walk into your presence... It's just easy to give thanks. It's easy to be joyful. It's easy to have great supplication with them. But we are to do it at all times. Now we come to this command in verse number 19. And it is a general statement. It's quench not the spirit. Quench means to extinguish, retard, or to stifle. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 48, it is used for putting out a fire. Now I know this is, what, September the 12th, right? Yesterday was September the 11th. 
And when we think of September 11th, we think of you know the, those planes hitting those towers and those and that plane that hit the Pentagon and the other plane that crash landed there in Pennsylvania. And you know the, the thing that really destroyed those towers wasn't the plane; it was the fire, the, the the inferno that was going on inside that building. It just made all that metal start to warp and and made it to crush underneath the weight of everything around it. When you get things that hot, they just begin to crush. And, and, and oh, that they would have loved nothing more than to quench that fire. Because fire can be destructive, but at the same time, fire can be an amazing thing. I mean, if you have ever been lost in the woods <laughs> and it's cold outside, to be able to light a fire means a lot, doesn't it? Or even if you just are out camping. People sit around that campfire and just have a great time, don't they? When we talk about quenching not the, the spirit, he is depicted all through the Bible many times as a fire. In Acts in chapter 2, he comes to the very first church. And he appears as a cloven tongue of fire. Almost as if it was above those apostles' heads. And they went out. And they, they, they did an amazing work on that first day, didn't they? When the power of the Spirit came upon them. I think when I get to heaven, one of the things that, that I'm kind of hoping for, and I don't know how things are going to be in heaven exactly, but I kind of hope that I can look through the annals of time and see those things as they occurred. Be able to see what Peter looked like and what this cloven tongue looked like and to see him go out and preach. And by the way, when he preached, one of the things that we know is that everybody heard his sermon in their own language. I don't think Peter was out there speaking all kinds of different languages. I think he was preaching and the people heard the different languages. That was the ministry of the Spirit on that day. It's an amazing day. Many people became believers on that day. Church was started. Paul told Timothy then to kindle afresh the gift of the Spirit that is in you. The Holy Spirit is inside every believer. And you know what happens sometimes? The, the Holy Spirit comes into the believer's life upon his conversion and that flame starts and it gets going and then all of a sudden the believer hits a hard time or some things happen and they start quenching the spirit and they start um, um, extinguishing that fire and the fire starts going down and down and down and down and Paul tells Timothy kindle it we heat our house in the winter almost exclusively with wood. Saves a lot of money that way over the propane tank I got sitting out there. And when that fire burns down, as long as there's some coals still in there, I can throw some new wood on top of it and then blow and, and get the flames to go on and get the fire to get going again. And that's what Paul's telling Timothy to do. Throw some kindling back on that wood. Let the Holy Spirit, grow in you. The fire is there. Get it going again. Don't extinguish it. Don't stifle the flames of the Spirit. Now, we must recognize that the Holy Spirit can be quenched. There's a certain group of people out there, a certain church out there that will tell you that you can't quench the Spirit. The Spirit is either alive and active in you, or... You just don't have the Spirit. The Spirit might come and go, or you just never were a believer. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit's going to be there, and you can't quench it. Well, you must be able to, or this command wouldn't be there. <laughs> Why would God say, quench not the Spirit, if you can't quench Him? The other thing you can do to the Spirit, according to Ephesians 4.30, that says, grieve 
not the Spirit. You can quench the Spirit. You can grieve the Spirit. There's also some other things you can do to the Spirit. Acts 7 says you can resist the Spirit. And Matthew 12, 24 says you can blaspheme the Spirit. But I want to concentrate on quenching and grieving. Because <laughs> here's what's happened. The Holy Spirit's trying to work in your life. You're a believer. You quench the Spirit. When you quench Him, or you, you retard the fire that He's trying to get going in you, you throw water on Him, if you will. His response is to be grieved. Quench the Spirit, and He is grieved. Well, by the way, I think that the church today, in many cases, is quenching the Spirit right from the very top. And as a result, I believe the Spirit is grieved all through the world in churches and in believers' lives. I think he's grieved. So what is the Holy Spirit's work? If we're going to talk about quenching the Spirit, we need to talk about what he does. What does the Holy Spirit do? Well, when the Lord was ascending into heaven, one of the things that he said, and this is just before the day of Pentecost that we talked about, he's ascending into heaven, and what he says, I am going to release the Spirit to you. He's been talking about it all along. There's a comforter, even the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive. It seeth him not. It doesn't know him. But you know him because he's going to be in you. But it's going to take the, whole, the, the, the Lord to die on the cross and ascend into heaven. And after that, then he released the Holy Spirit upon the believers. And that's the day of Pentecost. And from that day on, if you become a believer, the Holy Spirit's in you. But really, one of the things that he says and what the Holy Spirit does is, God was here, was he not? Jesus is God. He was here. So he says, God is still going to be here. After I leave, you're still going to have me. You're still going to have God. It's just going to take on a different form. It used to be that Jesus was standing right in front of the apostles, in front of the disciples, in front of everybody, and they could see him. But now, you no longer physically see him. But he's still alive and active. It's just in you now. So God just simply takes a different form, if you will. So Jesus was teacher, friend, guide, resource, helper, comforter. You know what the Holy Spirit is? He is teacher, friend, guide, resource, helper, comforter. The Holy Spirit is God. You still have God. And you can rely upon him. You can lean upon him. Now, one of the other problems, I think, when we talk about who the Holy Spirit is, what he does, I do believe that many good Bible-believing churches tend to shy away from teaching about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does. I believe that the charismatic movement that emphasizes the Holy Spirit and put the Holy Spirit up on a pedestal, if you will, to the point where they're teaching a false doctrine about him, I believe that has moved many good churches to kind of shy away from teaching about the power of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does. Because I believe many of those churches are fearful of being called part of the charismatic movement, if you will. The reality is they counterfeit him and they, they misrepresent him. He gets turned into some kind of genie where we can just turn to him and whatever I tell him to do, he's going to do, as if he's some kind of Santa Claus. And then they work their way into all kinds of different things that the Holy Spirit might do in them and through them that the Holy Spirit doesn't do. 
And then we come to the opposite end of that. And that is some churches that kind of repress the Holy Spirit to the point where we don't look to him at all. And when it comes to trials and struggles in this world, where the Holy Spirit can fill us and give us peace and give us that this power that we need, we're so afraid of being like one end that they slide all the way over to the other end. And instead of relying upon the Holy Spirit, they introduce counselors and psychologists. And so we have Galatians 3, 3 that says, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, we have the Holy Spirit. He has an amazing work to do in you. And you recognize that he's the one that, that, that sanctifies you and draws you to God and, and helps you with your righteousness and all these different things. And so your salvation is through the Holy Spirit, through what Christ has done on the cross for your sins. But now you're going to push him off to the side and rely upon your flesh for everything else. You're going to rely upon your flesh and the world to help you have peace and, and help you get rid of your anxieties and all these things in the world. And it just shouldn't be so. The Holy Spirit has all the power. Rely upon Him. Look to Him to do His part. The Holy Spirit, by the way, one of His other functions is to move you to the goal of perfection. Being like Christ. Galatians 4.19 says, I have pain until Christ is fully formed in you. You know, one of the things that pastors should have a desire for all of their congregation is that they would move step by step by step by step to being like Christ. You know how we do that? Oh, we don't do it by, by going out and finding some kind of special formula that some man has come up with and just say, listen, if you say this prayer and you do this this amount of times and you do this this amount of times, you're going to grow in Christ. You know how you really grow in Christ? It's the power of the Holy Spirit in you. He's the one that does the perfecting work. Yes? There are hardships, there's trials, there's struggles that come along. You rejoice evermore, you pray without seeing, you get without ceasing, you give thanks in all things. And as you take those steps through the hardships of your life, you know what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life? He's helping to perfect you. And that's being like Christ. Now, who is exactly like Christ on this earth? No one. Charles Spurgeon, Billy Graham, whoever you might go with, none of them were perfect. And I know you've got people in your life that are spiritual giants, that were amazing people, that seemingly had no sin and were just like Christ and had Christ written on their face all the time. You know what? They weren't perfect. They were still in their battle. They were still moving to perfection. The Holy Spirit was still working in their lives. But they seemed like they were closer to perfection than maybe you were. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was filling their lives more of the time, probably. As they were moving step by step by step by step until they passed away and entered glory. And at that time, then they were perfect. Made perfect. So you want to stifle the Holy Spirit? Guess what? You'll never move towards perfection if you quench the Spirit. You will stay as a babe in Christ. You might have a hard time even finding the Holy Spirit in your life if you quench him to such a point that there's hardly even a fire left. You know what else the Holy Spirit does? He illuminates the Word of God. 
First Peter 2 2 says, As babes desire the pure milk of the word that you might grow thereby. You know how another way that a believer moves through his life towards perfection? He reads the word of God. The word of God tells him how to live his life. Shows him step by step. So you feed on the word of God. If you're a babe in Christ, you know what it is? It's just milk, right? It, it's just little baby steps, if you will. It's just maybe even learning who Jesus is, that, that he is God. Learning about what Christ did on this earth. And then as you move towards perfection, you know what you're doing at the end of your life? My, my dad spent the last, I don't know, five years of his life just typing. If you want to find my dad, he had a spot on the couch <laughs> where he sat there with his computer and, and he would type and then he would take a nap and then he would type and then he would take a nap and then he would type and then he would take a nap. And literally, he has volumes upon volumes upon volumes of stuff in his computer that he just typed over the last five, ten years of his life. And, and if you type in his last name or you type in his name underneath books, You'll probably find 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 books that he wrote and put out there to self-publish stuff. He just typed and typed and typed and typed. You know what he was doing? He was digging apart the word of God, going back to the Greek and going back to what it said and, and trying to decide through the power of the Holy Spirit what each and every, not just verse, but you know parts of the verses and, and the words literally meant. And put it all together. He was doing stuff that is serious meat of the Word of God. And that should be what a believer does, right? You kind of start off just learning who God is. And as you move through your life, you're eating the meat that's there. And you know who wrote the Word of God? The Holy Spirit did. You know who is inside of each and every believer? The Holy Spirit's there. You know who illuminates the word of God to the believer? The Holy Spirit does. We don't have an excuse. He's there. He illuminates. And you know what it means to illuminate, right? If you are in, and that was one of the things that, uh, in listening to some of these people that were in the Twin Towers, when, when they came down, we listened to a firefighter explain how he was on the fourth floor in 110 stories of the Twin Towers, of the tower he was in, came tumbling down around him. You would think if someone were, were going to survive, they'd be the person on the 110th floor, right, as they kind of just rode the whole thing down. This guy with his whole crew of the fire department were on the fourth floor. And the Twin Towers collapsed around him. And it was dark. They couldn't see anything. They were, they were going to preserve their flashlights. Because they didn't want to run out of the batteries. Because they didn't know how long they would be underneath 110, I guess at that point in time. He was only, he was only underneath 106 stories of rubble, right? How long are you going to be there? And so they were sitting there in darkness... And all of a sudden, there was this little light that kind of started showing. And it got a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger. And they said they could look out from this one area and see the blue sky. And that was once all the, the dust kind of went away. It illuminated for them. They could see. And the little small skinny guys dug themselves a little hole to get out. That's what illumination is. You know what? When, we, when the world looks at the Bible, you know what they see? Darkness. They, they can't understand it. They don't believe it. They don't know what's going on with it. But when you become a believer, you know what happens? You read the Word of God. The Holy Spirit illuminates it. You can see what's happening. You begin to understand what it says. And as you move closer and closer and closer towards perfection... You understand more and more and more and more of it. 
you won't ever, I think, understand the whole thing. There's just so much there. We still need to study. 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, Just as it is written, things which eyes has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He illuminates the things which are written by him. And that's why when the world writes something, like in science, it doesn't add up to what the Word of God says. Now, science does correlate with the Word of God when science is applied properly. Let me say that. Because there's things in the Bible that were written 4,000 years ago that man did not discover until 200 years ago. It was there all the time. The science of the Bible is amazing, and it, it's, it's great, and it's good. And when science gets its act together, it agrees with the Word of God. First Corinthians 2.10 says, For to us God revealed it through the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. You know what you can do? You can quench the Spirit. You can quench the Spirit by not applying the words of God to your life, by not hiding the words of God in your heart, by not allowing it to dwell in you richly, and by not dividing the word of God accurately. You can quench the Spirit that way. You know what else the Holy Spirit does? He moves us down the path of separation. Do you know what holiness is? Holiness is separation from the world. Here's the world and all of its sin. The Holy Spirit is moving us to purity, Christ-likeness, and he does that through separation. As we become more and more and more like Christ, you know what we are? We're less and less and less and less like the world. We become separate from the world. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We all have an unveiled face. Now it's talking about Moses. He had the glory of God all over his face. And he wore a veil, didn't he? Because uh, the glory of God was shining upon him and people were kind of scared of that. You know what it says about the believer today? The Holy Spirit's inside of you. That veil should be torn off. Don't hide the Holy Spirit inside of you. Allow it to shine. Allow the world to see it. And when you look at the in the mirror, you know what you should see? The reflection of God's glory blazing off of you. And that's what the world should see too. You know what else the Holy Spirit does? He guides you in God's will. You need to recognize you can't run your own life. You need to yield to the Spirit. Psalm 143.10 says, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Let thy good Spirit lead me on level ground. You know what he does? He reveals God's will to you, and then he helps you navigate if a believer is just tripping all over, the world has to offer, that's no kind of testimony to the world. The Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He kind of shows you that general way that you're supposed to go. You can kind of see it. You know what God's will is for your life. But then he illuminates where your steps are. So you just know where to step and you're not going to trip over what the world is doing. You know what? You can quench the spirit. Go tripping over everything the world has to offer. Fall into every sin that the world has to give. You can quench the spirit that way. Let me give you one more thing. He strengthens us inwardly. All this that he's doing, he provides that inward strength. You, you need to combat a sin. You're not going to do it on your own. You know who's going to do it for you? Holy Spirit, that's inward strength. You need to grow in God, not going to do it on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. Want to understand Scripture and what it says? 
Be filled with the Spirit. Zechariah says, not by might or by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. How are you going to get around in this world? Don't quench the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. How are you going to grow more like Christ? Don't quench the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. <coughs> when you think that you are the source of strength, when you think you're going to do it on your own, when you think you're going to go out in this world and just have your way with it, that's when Satan wins. That's when you falter. That's when you fall. That's when you quench the Spirit. When you recognize that only the Spirit can be the one to help you with those things, then you can start seeing the fruit of the Spirit. And then you can rejoice evermore. You can pray without ceasing. You can get thanks in everything. Quench not the Spirit. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this lesson that you gave to us today. I pray, Lord, that as we, we navigate through this world, I know the Bible says we get a little bit on us as we go through this dirty, dirty, dirty world. And so we need to confess our sins. We need to recognize when there are sins. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. He's our, our comfort, our guide. He helps us through the hard times. He helps us to grow. He helps us to be more like Christ. I pray, Lord, that as this world is filled with anxiety and fear and destruction, that we as a believer can just be filled with the Holy Spirit and then have the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, faith, meekness, temperance. I pray, Lord, that those things would be evident in our life and that we can tear off the veil that many of us have around us so that the world can see it, that they would desire to have that. Father, now we just ask these things in your name. Amen. We have a closing song, number 474.